So part of the reason I wrote that article was to draw attention to the Palestinian people who are being slaughtered when I especially see and hear from the Latin patriarch of Jerusalem that women are being shot by IDF snipers and murdered on church property signed by the Latin patriarch of Jerusalem. And so I thought to myself, these are my brother and sister Christians. They are being murdered. And I would be thinking, why aren't the Christians in the West speaking up for me? Do they not care about the mystical body of Christ? Because in no way on earth can you accept politically the slaughter of majority of women and children. That's contrary to Christianity. That's contrary to the law that has developed since Christ and with Christ was even in the ancient world. So we who uphold Geneva Conventions, Israel must uphold those same Geneva Conventions. And, and it's because of these issues arising that the UN is interjecting itself and using the strang, strong language that has been brought up. I'll clearly use the word reckless slaughter without any hesitation. And he said by IDF snipers, toddlers had been shot point blank in the head and the heart, not separately, one child shot in the head and the heart of the world's most elite leading sniper units. He said, there's no way that's an accident. So I'm going on testimony of doctors risking their lives, trying to help the innocent women and children. And there's many innocent men there as well. When they're testifying to this and you have multiple testimonies, it's time to wake up and speak up. There's something going on. We have to speak up and instead of pretending, well, Israel's the chosen people of God, that's a false religious Zionism. Mm -hmm. All who seek God's will, all who love God, all who seek him are the ones that God has chosen. The true religion is Christianity. It is the way, the truth, and life. There is no other. But even that desire for God is a beginning of moving towards the true religion. And all of these people are acceptable to God. And even more so, anyone who is baptized belongs to the new Israel. And I'm not to judge who's also been baptized by desire. Only God can judge that. And therefore, all who belong to Christ belong to the true Israel. And anyone who denies Christ is pulling themselves away from the true Israel. The Jews need to know that we Christians love them. The Muslims need to know that we Christians love them. We sinful Christians need to know God loves us despite our sins and to stop thinking we're not sinners. Yes. And so let's all work towards the humility of Jew, Muslim, Christian. We are sinful people. We need to come to self-knowledge and recognize we're letting hate drive our hearts. Hate does not come from God. A way forward to loving each other and finding a way forward is what God wants for each and every one of us. So I offer that uh, prayer for each and, uh, uh, each and every one of us. So, Dr. Matthew Sakonikis is a professor of theology at Christendom College and expert in the Old Testament in biblical prophecy and theological anthropology, prolifically published. Today we're discussing an article that he wrote for Crisis Magazine against Catholic Zionism, tackling the important and controversial subject of Christian Zionism. There are millions of Christians who support the state of Israel, including its controversial military actions. Is this a viable Christian ideology, or is it based on a false theology, a false understanding of biblical prophecy? And perhaps the most important question, what does the Catholic Church actually teach? Pope Benedict XVI is invoked as an authority in Professor's article. Let us consider these questions. Let me begin with a uh, fundamental question. I, I know that the very word Zionism or Zionist uh, can have a couple of uh, different meanings or interpretations. Um, what is, generally speaking, the movement known as Christian Zionism? Well, um, and I'm going to back up just a little bit. So Zionism altogether, just being when the Jews, particularly in the late 1800s, early 1900s, were developing 
a desire to have their own territory homeland uh, with many persecutions that had gone on. Uh, when we come to Christian Zionism, um, I'm not sure quite how widely it goes, but usually when I'm speaking against specific, specifically a Christian Zionism, I'm speaking against what would be called a religious Zionism. And that would be, I'm speaking against the false prophetic idea that the return of the Jews to the homeland in what was called Palestinian territory under the British Empire, or even crumbling British Empire, which was taking over the crumbling Ottoman Empire, that somehow the return of Jews to that specific geography was the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. So while I don't have a problem with Zionism in general, I do have a problem specifically with what is called religious Zionism because it's claiming to fulfill Old Testament prophecy. And as a Christian, I can only point to Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets and to have an interpretation that takes place outside of that would be heretical. That it's contrary to the incarnation and that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all promises of the Old Testament, particularly of a final exodus of the gathering of all of God's people into one nation, which is the reconstituted Israel, which would be the church. The church is the new Israel, even as defined in Vatican II. <laughs> the dogmatic constitution on the church, 9.3, you have Israel according to the flesh, and then Israel reaching its true spiritual fulfillment, which is the kingdom of the Messiah, which is not of this world. And so that kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. Jesus Christ is the son of David and head. And any interpretation that would say that the Jews going to that specific geography is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy as a Catholic, which means as a Christian rooted in apostolic Christianity, that would be a heretical interpretation of what's happening in what was the former land known as Palestine and still is Palestinian territory, except where the UN has accepted that Israel is a nation not to be confused with Israel before 70 AD. In other words, the Israel of today is a, a political state that you cannot necessarily say is connected to the Israel prior to 70 AD. And so that's probably what would upset a lot of people who want to, because the most confusing thing is calling it Israel. And that, that is no longer Israel religiously, it is Israel politically. And I don't have a problem with supporting Israel politically. I only have a problem with pretending that is the same Israel as before 70 AD. That would be my yeah. position stated bluntly. Yeah, tremendous, tremendous. Because th there has been so much, uh, so many Christians, especially in a lot of Protestant circles, who will support uh, the modern state of Israel, even politically and militarily, on the basis of what they perceive to be biblical prophecies. And, and you're basically right. saying, Professor, that these biblical prophecies are a misreading or flawed theology and essentially uh, contradict uh, a genuine messianic prophecy of that points to Christ. Yes, it ignores God's pedagogy, how God was incrementally moving mankind individually, as a nation, institutionally, creating proper memories, developing our ability to come to worship God in spirit and in truth, which is what the Messiah accomplishes. Israel, Israelite religion was only in its infancy when Moses took it out of Egypt. It needed a lot of reforming to reach the point of inculcating a proper monotheism, inculcating a proper understanding of what God always wanted. We only speak of Judaism. There's a distinction between the Israelite religion under Moses and Judaism. Judaism is only one of the tribes of Israel, and it is the tribe most specifically that is returning 
after the Babylonian captivity and reinstituting the Deuteronomic laws as it awaited the Messiah, which comes through the line of Judah. And so I think specifically what's being ignored in Protestant prophecy is because there's such a misunderstanding since overall Protestantism, right? Because there's, there's, a, there's many interpretations of what Protestantism means. But I'm going to speak in a generalization, and that would be because of its rejection of the Catholic Church, specifically what would be seen as the Roman Rite of the Catholic Church in the West, because of its rejection, it rejected the, the, the authority amongst the visible aspects of the Catholic Church in the 16th century. But it at the same time also ignored the sacramental aspects of the Catholic Church, which were really participations in the mystery of Jesus Christ, who had become the mystical temple that all Judaism was awaiting. So why did I move from Israelite to Judaism to Catholic? I did that to show that actually the one thing that God always had as primary in his intentions for religion is what came last. What came last is the Messiah, which all the promises to Abraham of the, of the land and nation, the dynasty through whom the Messiah would come, and the worldwide blessing that he wanted, that the Messiah ushers in Torah for the whole world. Jesus, and Jesus issued Torah in for the whole world, and so therefore Messianic Israel is the true religion, and that true religion took place in Jesus Christ. And so, therefore, the Catholic Church rightly calls itself the new Israel, and what must stop being ignored is Jesus is the true temple. Because so many in the Protestant religion think of religion in purely spiritual terms, ignoring that Christ still manifests his presence through the sacraments, they're not speaking, they're not thinking properly of understanding Jesus as the new temple especially towards St. Paul's letter to the Hebrews, particularly chapter 10, that we have a new temple, a new high priest, and a new veil that we cross through, which is the body and blood of Jesus risen from the dead, uniting ourselves to him. Therefore, since Jesus is the true temple, in God's pedagogy, moving us from giving a land so that he could teach his people to be freed of all the false religion, which takes a very long time and must be institutionalized, to have the dynasty through whom the Messiah comes. Once the Messiah comes, he takes the nation and land, he takes the dynasty into himself, and so he takes the temple into himself. So what the Jews are truly awaiting is what Jesus has accomplished and done. He is the temple, which means you no longer need a physical land for Jesus. You no longer need a dynasty for Jesus. You have the fulfillment of the law and the prophets in him. So trying to establish a land, trying to establish things based on blood or dynasty are taking us backwards, not forwards into the true religion God was trying to establish in stages through the pedagogy of God. And we can think of this in terms of who really thinks God wants animal sacrifice right now and again. The whole world, for the most part, is disgusted with that. So why would you, so in other words, since the whole purpose of the land was to stick a temple in the middle, and the temple of that time was for animal sacrifice, why on earth would you think God wants you to take back that land? And so the problem we have today is the political Zionism, which I can support and in many ways do support, has turned to a religious Zionism since the 90s. And it's grown in power, and that religious Zionism now is leading to the current government of Israel. If you read what the current leadership says, you have the former head of Shin Bet saying, religious terror being committed by Jewish settlers, and he used the word terror, is leading and provoking the kinds of responses that we're getting. This must stop. In other words, settlers think that they can take that land back because it's God's will, contrary to all international law. We can be abusive to people because they're not God's chosen people. That religious, religious mindset, which comes from Kahanism, from Rabbi Meir Kahane, from the United States, New York City, has infiltrated many of those who are the religious settlers. 
It's entered into the cabinet of Netanyahu. And these people are producing a religious Zionism now, of which the head of Mossad recently had discussed one month before the horrific attack on the Israelite citizens by Hamas, a terror group. One month before Hamas launched its terror campaign against Israelis, the former head of Mossad, who in 2016 retired from Mossad, the chief of Mossad said one month before that at attack in 2023 of October, in September in the AP, he called specifically Israel, quote, an apartheid state, not moving towards an apartheid state, quote, an apartheid state. You have the former prime minister of Israel, Ehud Omer, discussing that the current prime minister knows the abuse that these settlers are doing, how they're provoking the Palestinians, that murder is being committed by them, and they're turning a blind eye to it, published in Haaretz only two months ago, and saying that, that Netanyahu is soon going to have to have arrest warrants issued against him for turning a blind eye and having full knowledge of these events taking place. So part of the reason I wrote that article was to draw attention to the Palestinian people who are being slaughtered when I especially see and hear from the Latin patriarch of Jerusalem that women are being shot by IDF snipers and murdered on church property signed by the Latin patriarch of Jerusalem. And so I thought to myself, these are my brother and sister Christians. They are being murdered. And I would be thinking, why aren't the Christians in the West speaking up for me? Do they not care about the mystical body of Christ? I'm not speaking up because there's any animosity specifically to Jewish people. I have a problem with the Israeli government as testi testified to by two intelligence agencies inside Israel, Shin Bet and Mossad, and even the head of their defense ministry has sided with Shin Bet that this is a serious problem. Three of three intelligence agencies saying this is going on, then I must speak up. I must speak up for the sake of, I do want to see Israel as a political entity survive because it's supposed to be a liberal democracy. But this kind of behavior, this kind of religious extremism does not make for a liberal democracy. And so since I want to see that survive in the Middle East, I want to see Israel successful, and I want the Christians specifically to be safe, and I want the innocent Muslims specifically to be safe, I'm piping up and speaking for the two-state solution so we can have peace instead of, instead of green lighting slaughter. Yeah, yeah, tremendous, yeah. tremendous. Yeah, there's so, so much there. Um, first of all, I just want to say um, I, I appreciate it, Professor, how uh, how bluntly uh, you're able to call out the injustices, the, the slaughtering of so many innocent Palestinians, while at the same time acknowledging the atrocities of October 7th. And... There's there's so much there. Like one of the things that you pointed out is this isn't anti-Jewish sentiments, right? Because we live in a Western political culture where often language is very manipulated. And if you have the courage to simply critique the unjust military policies of uh of the israeli government or or uh the war crimes of uh the idf i mean the the un there was a member of the un who literally used the word genocide when speaking about yes. what's happening the, the the number has been now forty thousand people innocent palestinians killed uh eighteen thousand of them children and i think that yes. It's important for us as Christians, as you said, not to not to blindfully fall into any false ideology, false theology, false teaching that will in any way try to justify such a uh, desecration of human dignity. So you hit it on the head. You hit it on the head, Father. It is the religious Zionism which is distinct from political Zionism, 
that is justifying a mentality that because other people, in their opinion, according to the old law, are not the chosen people of God, which is now false since the Messiah, there's no longer distinction between Jew or Greek before God. So there's no kind of justification for race-based distinctions like that. And so because of this, when Americans see their political leaders like Donald Trump, who I can say I voted for Donald Trump twice, and I, I jokingly like to say in separate elections, meaning as a joke towards when people are voting twice when they shouldn't be. So I have voted for him each time. But when I see him justifying that Israel has the right in some sense to finish off the job, I think those kinds of statements are incredibly dangerous. Because it is that kind of mentality where people who see Trump as restoring America to its proper constitutional principles start mistaking what he says as a justification for what Israel is doing religiously. Because in no way on earth can you accept politically the slaughter of majority of women and children. That's contrary to Christianity. That's contrary to the law that has developed since Christ and with Christ was even in the ancient world. Yeah. So we who uphold Geneva Conventions, Israel must uphold those same Geneva Conventions. And, and it's because of these issues arising that the UN is interjecting itself and using the strong, strong language that has been brought up. I'll clearly use the word reckless slaughter without any hesitation. And so th this is what's moving towards uh, only they can decide are these war crimes. But I can tell you from standing back and when I watch a, an American orthopedic surgeon who went into Gaza testifying on CBS News, um, what was his name? Dr. Mark Pullmutter on CBS News only a month ago returning, and this is when it aired, discussing he was caring for toddlers who had been shot, and he said by IDF snipers, toddlers had been shot point blank in the head and the heart, not separately, one child shot in the head and the heart of the world's most elite leading sniper units. He said, there's no way that's an accident. So I'm going on testimony of doctors risking their lives, trying to help the innocent women and children. And there's many innocent men there as well. When they're testifying to this and you have multiple testimonies, it's time to wake up and speak up. There's something going on. Yeah. So I'm not a criminal court. I can't speak to other things. But when I hear serious testimony on serious news stations reporting these things, we have to speak up. And instead of pretending, well, Israel's the chosen people of God, that's a false religious Zionism. Mm -hmm. All who seek God's will, all who love God, all who seek him are the ones that God has chosen. The true religion is Christianity. It is the way, the truth, and life. There is no other. But even that desire for God is a beginning of moving towards the true religion. And all of these people are acceptable to God. And even more so, anyone who is baptized belongs to the new Israel. And I'm not to judge who's also been baptized by desire. Only God can judge that. And therefore, all who belong to Christ belong to the true Israel. And anyone who denies Christ is pulling themselves away from the true Israel. That's a point blank, point blank theological statement, and there's no anti-Semitism. How come? If I'm anti-Semitic, then I'm also anti-Catholic. How come? I'm more critical of Catholics for being hypocritical, sinful, causing scandal, disgracing the church, justifying evils. I'm the first to speak up against that as well. So if my speaking religiously and truthfully makes me anti-Semitic, then you also better call me as a devout Catholic, anti-Catholic. Because I will just as clearly speak up and say the Catholic leadership has embarrassed itself in so many ways. And not that the Catholic lady is not as sinful, if not more sinful. It's just I don't have the voice as a bishop. They have in so many ways disgraced themselves that it's harder to have a voice as a Catholic to even speak against moral issues. So if I, my saying that is speaking against many Catholic leaders, then I'm anti-Catholic too. And yet that would be a silly statement to make considering I'm trying to convert people to the Catholic faith. So my yeah. statements critical of Israeli policy 
my statement's critical of, of extremist, religious, Zionist, Kahanist theology makes me anti-Semitic, then my theology also makes me anti-Catholic. So let's give up the woke name calling and let's have real dialogue and discussion. And the real dialogue and discussion should be, if Jesus prophesied in 30 to 33 AD that this generation before him will see the destruction of the temple because of the rejection of him, and 40 years later that temple was destroyed and there's never been animal sacrifice offered in the temple for over 2,000 years, why would anyone on earth want to go back to that? And if you agree we shouldn't go back to that, then why would you hold a religious Zionism that wants that and wants to see the third temple rebuilt, which is why Itamar Ben-Gavir, the Minister for National Security, a known Kahanist, on August 13th, brought thousands of Jews in violation of Jewish rabbinic teaching onto the Temple Mount to pray in the hopes of restoring a third temple. So if you think I'm making these things up, just read the Jewish newspapers themselves and what's going on and how critical the heads of all the intelligence agencies are of these kinds of things that are occurring right now. The Israelis are more critical than me. So wake up, and all of you people who think you're taking the red pill and waking up and speaking against wokeism, you might be very, very guilty of the very wokeism you think you're fighting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's um, it's interesting how one of the political commentators who's um, who's who perhaps we can say has been red pilled when it comes to um, Israeli atrocities has been uh, Candace Owens. You know, she's someone who, of course, is a moral conservative. Uh, pro-life um, against the LGBTQ woke agenda and all this. But eventually she also stepped out and said, hey, if you're going to be a devout Christian, you cannot justify the slaughtering of all these innocent Palestinian women and children and men and think to yourself that somehow you're supporting Christianity because of false perceptions or blind perceptions of Israel, or, or even, the, as you're saying, the identity politics, right? Because it, it makes me think of, um, it makes me think of the way that we speak about something like gay marriage um, in the church and the secular culture. If you oppose gay marriage, you are often labeled as a bigot or homophobe, but in actual Catholic teaching, we make a distinction, of course, between identity and activity. And we'll say that the individual, of course, has uh, dignity as a child made in the image of God, but we, will, we would never support sinful activity that is detrimental to their spiritual or moral lives. And I think that's similar here, you know, identity versus activity. It's not anti-Jewish. It's not attacking anybody's identity. It's the activity of um, the destruction of human life. It's the activity of the... Um, e even, even in many accounts, there have been many accounts of raping victims. Um, among the Palestinians. And even as you even uh, point out, the colonialism with the settlers against uh, indigenous Palestinian lands. So there's so much there that's happening. And so the critique, of course, is against unjust activities and not an attack on anyone's personal religious or ethnic identity. So it's a universal standards. Yeah, and of course, the first response to pointing these things out is, well, why don't you talk more about the atrocities Palestinians are committing against Jews and Israel and, and the like? Well, we agree that any terrorism of any kind is reprehensible and must stop, especially when it's inspired by religious motives. And so we, we have to make distinctions. Where, what, what is going on religiously? What is going on politically? I'm a Christian. I, I want the human dignity of Jews 
and Muslims, both made in the image of God, to be protected and defended. And that means I want Jews and Muslims pr to protect the inherent human dignity of Christians also in the image of God. You'll notice that the clear doctrines of Christianity is before your religious mindset is Jewish, before your religious mindset is Mohammedan, Islamic, before your religious mindset is Christian, the revelation is every human is made in the image of God. So how disgusting it is to have anyone question whether or not someone's even really fully human. And you find this occurring outside of Christianity in the religious extremists of many religions, where the humanity of someone is denied. And, the, and, and I've known many people to be shocked to find out that um, this idea that Christians believe everyone's in the image of God, I've, I've heard of Muslims saying, I didn't know that you actually teach that. Yes, we teach that. And so I find liberal democracy, as it existed before Marxism, started infiltrating all sorts of liberal democracies and turning them into a more totalitarian repression within the liberal democracies. I support liberal democracy because I believe in inherent human dignity. I support Israel because I believe it supports inherent human dignity where someone can still feel free, if they're a Jew, to convert to Christianity, or if they're a Muslim, to convert to Christianity. And so because I support religious freedom without being coerced to be Jewish, Christian, or Muslim, I support liberal democracy. But I can't support liberal democracy where I see that kind of religious freedom being violated. I can support Muslim countries all the more where they support true, authentic religious freedom. Now, certainly, mocking other people's religions, insulting their prophets. That's not, that's not the kind of free speech in a liberal democracy that's, that's going to be healthy, because that doesn't produce good interreligious dialogue. And so it is so important that we recapture, you and I right now are talking where you're located right now in Europe. Would we, would we call Poland Central or Eastern? How would you, how would you call Poland? Depends who you ask. Uh, I, I've always, uh, okay. I've always thought of it as Eastern Europe, but I recently read a George Weibel book where he said Central Europe. <laughs> huh. I'm no expert on these things, that's for sure. But my my point being, you and I can have this conversation where we trust. We're not going to have a regime throw us in jail for hate speech because we're trying to speak well of the protection of every human being. And this is part of what liberal democracies were about, that to, to bring an end to killing each other over religious wars so that we can have the freedom through dialogue to perceive what's true. And so free speech exists in order for us to come to, to debate, to show who has the better ideas, to show who is reflecting more fully and accurately on a religious system and who are the nut jobs on the left and on the right. And so because natural law tells us human life is good, we believe people who want to defend all human life because they're upholding natural law, that life is good and should be protected, that intelligent life is higher than plant life because it has dominion over it through intelligence and therefore must care for the world because that which is higher must care for what is lower. And so the stewardship we have of the whole world, but the most important stewardship is that which involves the stewardship of the gift of being human and all that belongs to our humanity and, and recognizing the importance of intelligence is to come to the truth. Intelligence isn't, isn't, doesn't exist for us to suppress others, but to help others flourish. And so only where we see flourishing do we see goodness. Only we, where, we, where we recognize the truth is the highest good because it enables us to love because you can't love what you don't know, then truth is at the service of love. And so what we're really after is for humans to stop using religious purposes to hate each other, but to use religion for truth so we learn to love each other and recognize the image of God in every single human person. So what we're really speaking for here is the recognition that we can't use religion as a means for political ideology to kill our enemies. 
Religion must be used to love our enemies, to do good to those who hate us. You and I are not after hating anyone here. We're speaking the truth to protect innocent human life, so religious extremism isn't used as an excuse for the slaughter of people. Yeah, yeah, and I wanted to uh, read a statement uh, that came out recently from um, from the Justice and Peace Commission of the Holy Land, uh, which is sponsored by the Assembly of the uh, Catholic Ordinaries of the Holy Land, uh, bringing together the bishops from the Latin, Greek, Malachite, Maronite, Armenian, Syriac, uh, Chaldean, Catholic leadership of Israel, Palestine, Jordan, and Cyprus. And the commission stated, quote, we are outraged that political actors in Israel and abroad are mobilizing the theory of just war in order to perpetuate and legitimate the ongoing war in Gaza. This theory is being used in a way in which it was never intended to justify the death of tens of thousands, our friends and our neighbors. And then the statement goes on to reference uh, certain um, conditions of just war theory. Uh, both of us have had experiences, I believe, of uh, teaching uh, Christian morality classes on the college campus. And we know that just war theory has certain conditions like proportionality and uh, no direct killing of innocent uh, non-combatants. But it seems like even the bishops and the patriarch in the Holy Land are very clear at what's happening here and they're living out the situation personally so it's such first-hand experience. Uh, and so as a appeal to Christians, especially Catholics, because I feel that sometimes we can fall into false notions of traditionalism, false notions of orthodoxy. Um, you are a professor at Christendom College. I used to teach at Franciscan University. University of Steubenville, both Orthodox colleges who believe in um, loyalty to the church, but that doesn't mean that traditionalism by any means has to apply to a political support for uh, the military actions of the state of Israel. Um, but in that regard, I also wanted to ask you, how would you distinguish, because I notice you've made a uh, distinction how would you distinguish between religious Zionism and political Zionism? I'm going to come back to that question. I just want to comment on what you just said as a reminder to people, because I thought the point you brought up was so incredibly rich and important. <clears throat> um, you talked about all the bishops of the Middle East, of all the particular churches that exist in that geography. And I, I want to remind people, who knows better? The bishops, as the preservers of apostolic tradition, who are on site in the Middle East, or Americans making commentary from ideologies limited by the press coverage and political affiliations to which they belong, who is on the ground with better insight to tell us what is going on and what church teaching is? People need to consider that very carefully. These are the apostolic successors whose family members are involved in all of this, who know the tradition. And the church began in the East. And so they're from the most ancient churches who have come together to say, do not use just war theory to justify what's going on. Anyone who ignores that needs to seriously consider how well they're listening, gathering the facts, taking counsel from wise men, which is what we're supposed to do when it comes to making prudential decisions. Political Zionism and religious Zionism, now coming back to the question that you asked, how do I differentiate them? It's difficult because at the core of the political Zionism, they did tie, whether it's admitted or not, they did tie the idea that somehow that land was properly still belonging to anyone with a Jewish identity. It was supported at the time. 
consider it's the early 1900s. We're moving through World War I, and Britain has, <clears throat> it's towards the end of World War I, the Balfour Declarations are made. The British Empire is overseeing those points in the Middle East, particularly Palestine. Politically, it has the authority to move and assist Jews who want to move into that territory. Why at the end of World War I, around the time of 1917, mark the date, why between 1917 and 1920 do we see much more British support for political Zionism, which consists of bringing the European models of democracy into the Middle East? Well, what did 1917 mark? The advent of Bolshevism. And so in some degree, and when you read Churchill's defense and article in which he wrote an article in the 1920s, basically the title was something like Zionism or Bolshevism. The idea was to use Zionism politically as a barrier to the development of Marxism. You'd have to read that article carefully and draw your own conclusions. So the support was to see democracy being brought by European Jews into the Middle East. And since British were in control of those territories, it was seen as spreading democracy. Well, I certainly support democracy. I don't support it in a colonial effort that doesn't recognize the right since particularly the Geneva Conventions or after the Geneva Conventions, a kind of colonialism that justifies taking land from rightful people already there. I can't do that because I believe in international law and the rule of law, particularly upholding the order since World War II. But I also certainly support the spread of liberal democracy as a barrier to, at that time, Soviet movements against democracies. And therefore, I certainly would have supported Israel as a political entity. I, I don't like the name very much because it points back to somehow this is the continuation of something that hadn't existed for 2,000 years. That is no longer the Israel before 70 AD. It is a political movement of, of liberal democracy in its founding of Jewish ethnicity it wasn't necessarily a form of religious movement in which they wanted to reestablish a temple and speak as though they had a superiority over ethnically non-Jews, which we saw growing in the 1990s from the 1980s of Kahanism. Meyer Kahanis, the rabbi from New York who then went out there and was spreading this kind and was labeled a racist who was labeled by Israel's who wouldn't listen to him and would leave the, the Israeli Senate whenever he spoke because they saw him as a racist, who labeled his followers in courts as inciting racism and supporting terror groups from, a, from the courts of Israel. That is what I'm calling religious Zionism because it's extremist. And the problem is, Many Israelis believe that is beginning to dominate political discussion. And so we see a movement that has moved from political Zionism into religious Zionism and is absolutely being supported as religious Zionism, which I see as heresy for Christians, a rejection that Jesus is the true land and true temple. It is being absolutely supported by evangelical Christians in America. And that, in my opinion, is a movement into rejection of the mystery of Jesus himself as fulfillment of the law and prophets. So while I believe people are free to come to their own religious development, I think they need to read the truth. And the truth isn't something we read just by reading the Bible out of context. We also have to look at the providence of history. If God for 2,000 years eliminated animal sacrifice, do you really think he wants us to go back to it? Have we not grown up as a people to see that what God really wants is a humble and contrite heart? That the Torah was given to people 
The books of Moses were given to people who were culturally Egyptians. They had lived for 400 years of their family life in Egypt, and they were more culturally Egyptian than they were monotheistic. And the Torah was trying to free them from that. And that's why wisdom literature, which comes after the settlement of the dynasty of King David and of King Solomon, a wisdom literature develops, which is the progression that God desired of understanding a natural law meant for all races and all people. God was using the law pedagogically. So while he left intact the kind of sacrifices that were still occurring in other lands so that they didn't fall back into those religious practices, when the Messiah came, he got rid of the religious practices of sacrifice that were immature and God really didn't want. Certainly sacrificing the best of your animals showed you wanted to give your best to God. But really giving your best to God is giving your mind and heart to God. That is the religion that God really sought and why Jesus tells the woman at the, at the Samaritan at the well, God wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. And to be worshipped in spirit and in truth is to put God first in your life in every way. And the true spiritual sacrifice is the true and absolute surrender of your will to God. Loving God with all of your heart, all of your mind, and all of your strength, and all of your soul. And now the true sacrifice of the body and blood of Jesus, which is now made present. Jesus doesn't die again and doesn't suffer again. His one-time sacrifice of his will, represented by you can't give your will any more than to the point of death. How can you give your will any more than to the point of death? Jesus has shown the true sacrifice of serving God even to the point of death. And we're all called to renew our commitment to that kind of sacrifice when we are offered through him, with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, we say, amen. I renew, I need to put God first in my life. I renew, that means Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That means I renew my dedication to the Ten Commandments so that I'm not working against love. And I renew my dedication to the Beatitudes so I'm entering into love. And I'm becoming a partaker in the divine nature. And the divine nature is the true land. God was promising himself. When God kicked the Israelites out of the tent of meeting because of the golden calf, they were supposed to originally have been able to enter the tent of meeting and be a holy nation. They're all kicked out because they broke the covenant. But Moses kept going in and out of that tent. And if you read Exodus chapter 3 very carefully, you know that when in Exodus chapter 34 it says the light would come out of Moses whenever he was speaking to God, it's referring to chapter 33, whenever he went into the tent of meeting, that the cloud, the glory cloud of God had come down upon, and God rested in the tent. The true land in which we were supposed to rest was always God, that Moses signified by coming out radiating light, showing he was a partaker of the divine nature. That's what God always wanted to give to Israel. It wasn't a physical geography. It was a physical geography so they could have a dynasty to give the Messiah who brings us back into resting in God, the true land. Let's stop follow religious extremism that was in temple for sacrificing animals, and let's reestablish a kind of liberal democracies that allow free speech so we can discuss authentic religious practices without hating each other and having respectful dialogue. And we'll all come to a knowledge of the truth that Christianity serves humanity best because Christianity doesn't reject you based on race, based on whatever is of a human level, because Christianity says every human is in the image of God and must be respected as the image of God. And even if they're not a Christian, they have to be accorded human rights. And wherever Christians have violated it, the church has corrected it. It's never applauded it. So let's have a real religious discussion of what's is healthier for the world and for peace. And I think we'll find the social doctrine of the Catholic Church is the best guidance for political discourse. Uh, professor, you mentioned in your article also the uh, contribution of Pope Benedict XVI, how he has written on this topic, of course, in his own magisterial authority. Uh, what can you tell us about that? Well, throughout our conversation, which is based on the article itself, throughout our conversation, the very beginning of the article was showing that when, when I'm speaking 
uh, in favor of more the political Zionism that supports liberal democracy, and I'm speaking against religious Zionism, I'm I'm actually using a, a distinction that the magisterium of the church is hoping that I'll make. And that is I'm following exactly at the very beginning of that article that Crisis Magazine ran. I use right away the quote from Pope Emeritus Benedict, who is clarifying that the magisterium could accept a political Zionism, but Christians cannot support religious Zionism because it would be this kind of religious Zionism that's occurring would be rejecting Christian belief that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. And therefore you can't have or see religious Zionism as fulfilling something in the Old Testament as kind of the Exodus God was referring to. The true Exodus God was referring to is the sacrifice and death of Jesus Christ that brings us into the true Holy Land, the resurrected body of Jesus Christ. And so all that we're speaking on is coming from the magisterium of the church when we speak about religious Zionism. We cannot support something that rejects Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. And I'd encourage people to take a look. It sounds like you'll be able to link that original article that will quote Benedict the 16th at the very beginning of the article from his 2018 article writing as a Pope Emeritus in Communio International Catholic Review, in which he's very clear we have to reject the religious Zionism because it rejects Jesus as a fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Yeah, and of course, uh, Pope Benedict XVI, I mean, as if his as if his papal authority wasn't enough before he became Pope, he was the uh, head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith. So an expert theologian himself, an academic, so somebody who speaks with immense authority when it comes to understanding this important topic. Absolutely. As, as the office held and tasked with defending what is authentically Catholic faith from what is working against authentically Catholic faith. So even more important, that service that he served even before becoming Pope. Yeah. Yeah, beautifully, yeah. beautifully put. I'm, I'm reminded of the um, great Palestinian scholar Edward Said and how he, he wrote his famous book, Orientalism. And I, I was thinking to myself how in Orientalism, he identifies the dehumanization of the Arab world uh, through the through a certain mainstream Western lens. And what's interesting, it, it almost seems like the um, the inversion of the chosen people mentality being also dehumanization of the other side. And I feel that we live in a culture where in order to justify atrocious atrocious actions, we need to linguistically or intellectually dehumanize. So you dehumanize the unborn child, you treat it as if it's not actually a baby, a child, a human life, so you can justify abortion. You dehumanize uh, the Arab world, the Arab and Muslim world, but not only Muslims, so many Christians, and it and while at the same time elevating another group of people as God's chosen race, and that also gives you a type of horrible justification through an identity politics that includes dehumanization that can um, truly rationalize too much, as, as opposed to the universal natural law ethic that you articulated that uh, Christian tradition, especially in Catholicism, calls us to. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I, I do agree with you. This is, you know, our media, particularly since 2001, has fed us a nonstop diet of hating um, the foreigner, especially the Muslim. <clears throat> um, and I think we need to recognize that while we have freedom of speech, the importance of being able to enter dialogue with the Muslim immigrant coming in. So, so do I have difficulties with forms of immigration that are not respecting 
simultaneously respecting the health of a nation. There's only so much legal immigration that can take place of which illegal immigration can damage the ability to have in place the, the proper social system that we have of social security, the various welfare systems for health. Before you collapse an economy, there is a reckless kind of immigration that can take place. And if politicians are feeding that, then they're also feeding xenophobia at the same time. And they're responsible for that kind of xenophobia because you can't ignore a reckless immigration that is destructive to a national identity and to the kind of ethos that holds up a constitution. So there's this kind of political game going on where we keep name calling each other while ignoring we're doing a politic that feeds it. Yeah. And so while I'm absolutely for welcoming the immigrant, we also have to recognize a nation. And in America, the differentiation of we have of between state governments and federal governments, how funding takes place. Prudential decisions are, are, are always key in social doctrine. It's not something that exists in a vacuum. There is the prudential decision of what is the historical reality. And too often the historical realities are being ignored. We're not having proper conversations. And the media is polarizing us. And we really need to find a way forward. I don't like the kind of anti-immigration dialogue I see going on, but I'm certainly against the reckless immigration that is breaking the very structures that if they fall, there's going to be an economic destruction the nation can't continue. So we do have to balance properly what it means to welcome the immigrant and what it means to speak against a government that for political purposes is trying to break those systems. And it's obvious in some degree there are people who are using ideologies to gaslight people into not speaking against reckless policies. And so once again, pretending you're xenophobic when you're not. <clears throat> and so it's a, it's a very delicate situation at all these levels. Yeah. Yeah. Tremendous. Yeah. I, I've even heard it um, described by one author as a, and perhaps this gets into a completely uh, different topic, but the description of a battle between globalists versus populists, that you're seeing a lot of that in terms of the immigration scene, uh, both in Europe and America. And, but but I, I love how you articulated it, to, to find that balance where you want to be open uh, to the immigrant to the foreigner we need to uh, always remind ourselves that the holy family were exiles in egypt uh but at the same time not to be reckless to the point of destroying uh, your own country's economic system and the well-being of your own people so i i think that often you will find the healthiest perspective in that middle ground so i, I definitely appreciate that Professor, thank you so much for your time. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation and I just want to commend you for writing on such an important topic, for speaking so boldly. I feel like we're living in a time where courageous voices are necessary and there are platforms that are allowing new voices to arise and to stand up against so much injustice and suffering, especially in the Middle East. I think that many, many uh, souls uh, in Gaza and Israel will be grateful for your perspective. So thank you so much. Well, praise be Jesus Christ, now and forever. Now and forever. And uh, the Jews need to know that we Christians love them. The Muslims need to know that we Christians love them. We sinful Christians need to know God loves us despite our sins and to stop thinking we're not sinners. Yes. And so let's all work towards the humility of Jew, Muslim, Christian. We are sinful people. We need to come to self-knowledge and recognize we're letting hate drive our hearts. Hate does not come from God. A way forward to loving each other and finding a way forward is what God wants for each and every one of us. So I offer that uh, prayer for each and uh, each and every one of us. So, um, so we'll end with that.